In this video, I'm going to be looking at these, the Beatles UK Reel to Reel tape albums. Hi, I'm Andrew from Parlogram Auctions, and this is Stella, my 1960 Stellaphone ST454 4 track reel to reel tape recorder. Produced by the Stella Radio and Television Company of Croydon in England, this four track single speed machine was one of the most popular of its type in the UK in the early 1960s. Until the mid 1950s, the customer base for machines like this was tiny. Tape was expensive, and few saw any reason to replace their expensive gramophone record collection. However, all that changed in 1953, when German businessman Max Grundig launched his well-built, well-specced, German-made tape recorders in Britain. With wartime rationing lifted and an increasing interest in the newfangled television, the audio entertainment market took off, and by 1954, Famous names such as Ferrograph, Truvox and Brunel began dominating the quality domestic and semi-professional tape recorder markets, albeit trailing well behind Grundig in sales. Far from being a high-end audiophile component, this was just one of a bewildering range of similar machines produced during the early 60s heyday of the domestic reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. When new, this machine would have set you back £38.17. shillings. That's a whopping £912, or just over $1,200 today. So a machine like this was definitely a grown-up purchase, which a teenage son or daughter might get a go on later, if they were lucky. In fact, these early domestic reel-to-reel -reel machines played a significant role in the early history of the Beatles. It was a Grundig Model TK20 reel-to-reel -reel machine which Paul McCartney borrowed in 1959 to write songs with John Lennon and record the Quarrymen on, as well as some early Beatles practice sessions. Also, in October 1962, King Size Taylor bought a Philips RK14 machine, which, like my Stellaphone, was a Philips EL3541 clone to record the Beatles during their final performances at the Star Club in Hamburg in December. These recordings were eventually released on the Live at the Star Club album in 1977. Reel-to-reel -reel recorders opened up a whole new world of possibilities for the teenage pop fan, as far as listening to pop music was concerned. You could borrow and record your friends' records, record your favourite songs off the radio or television, or even yourself or your friends singing. EMI was the first record company in the UK to exploit this new format. They'd been releasing pre-recorded tapes with little success since the 1950s, but by 1963, sales were beginning to look up. As Beatles records were selling by the shed load, it was a no-brainer for EMI to release their music on pre-recorded reel-to-reel tape. So, in December 1964, they confidently took out this full-page advert promoting the new tape records in the programme for that year's Beatles Christmas show. EMI went on to release all of the Beatles albums on quarter inch, three and three quarter inches per second twin track mono tape reels on or shortly after their vinyl release. All tapes from 1963's Please Please Me up to Sgt Pepper in 1967 came inside a five inch lidded box with a reproduction of the album cover on the lid and the songs and sundry credits on the underside of the tray. Each tape was wound onto a 4-inch clear spool and given the TA catalogue number prefix before its regular album number. So, for example, the twin-track mono tape of Please Please Me carried the catalogue number TA PMC 1202. The only other album issued on a 5-inch reel was the White Album. The 4-inch reels were held in place in their trays by means of a specially formed white card inner tray. 
The end of the tape was secured to the reel by means of a tiny green and gold Parlophone sticker and was further held in place by a little white clip, which was nearly always quickly discarded. Like the vinyl LP labels, the sold in the UK statement was printed amongst the text on the underside of the box, sometimes along with a small pink star. This is often mistaken for a flaw, but was actually put on by EMI to help retailers with their purchase tax accounts, as it indicated that the tape had been supplied on a sale or return basis. Each box also included an EMI tape advertising information leaflet. This larger one is most commonly found in tapes from 1963 to 1964. It was then redesigned into a more detailed two-page affair, which included more on four-track and stereo tapes. Also in the box was a small packing slip, which was to be returned with the tape if it was found to be faulty. There are actually two variations of these packing slips. The earliest ones just refer to return, while the later ones ask whether the tape is twin-track mono or four-track stereo. The twin-track mono tapes had white leaders for part one, or side one, and red for part two. The four-track stereo reels had yellow leaders for part one, and also red for part two. The leaders were printed with the artist, album, catalogue number and copyright information. Production cost of these tapes was high, especially as they were duplicated in real time. Therefore, they were retailed at a higher price than the vinyl albums, by 8% in fact. This price list from June 1967 shows that a vinyl copy of Sgt Pepper would have cost you 32 shillings, 5 pence halfpenny, while the mono reel-to-reel equivalent would have set you back a full 35 shillings. That's £33, or $43 today. 1968 saw the introduction of the newly designed, fully transparent jewel case, which were hinged and had a clip in the centre of the right-hand side of the box. The white album Abbey Road and Let It Be came only in these cases, both as two-track mono and four-track stereo tapes, as did the 1968 reissues of the mono albums. All of the Beatles' pre-white album albums were later released as four-track stereo reels, but very late on in the day. They're amongst the hardest to find of all the original reels and were released at exactly the same time as the first cassettes. This is confirmed by the 7009 number, which is actually the date code for September 1970, which appears on the inserts of both this stereo rubber sole reel-to-reel and the first cassette issue. Unlike in the USA, Magical Mystery Tour and Yellow Submarine were never issued in the UK on reel-to-reel, and didn't make it onto cassette until 1973. Today, kids just have to tap on a screen to get their music. But back in the 1960s, they had to be a little more technically minded. Just look at how complex this thing was inside. OK, so you didn't have to know how all this worked, but you had to know how to thread a tape and understand which way round everything went, and maybe even clean the heads from time to time. Threading a tape, like placing a record on a turntable, is very ritualistic. But how does the sound quality compare? Let's find out. Over the years, I've managed to collect most of the original UK reel-to-reels. And although they play and sound great on Stella here, I'm going to use my trusty Revox A77 to transfer them onto my computer, so I can show you the waveforms of the recordings of the tapes. Although I've recorded the complete albums, I'm just going to compare individual tracks of interest. And where better to start than with I Saw Her Standing There from this Please Please Me tape. Now with a playback speed of 3 and 3 quarter inches per second, this is clearly not going to be an audiophile experience. And straight away, the limitations of the tape are obvious. Here's a comparison with an original UK first vinyl pressing. As you can see, the reel below has pretty good dynamics compared to the vinyl above, but suffers from having virtually no audible information 
above the 10,000 Hz or 10K frequency range. However, that's not to say the reel-to-reel -reel sounds terrible. It does have a nice warm bass and is free from the compression and EQ Harry Moss added at the vinyl cutting stage. This is especially noticeable on this album and with the Beatles, where the sound is much drier than the vinyl and the reduction in the reverb is clear. This is Tell Me Why from A Hard Day's Night, which, like the whole album on tape, sounds rather flat. Although there's some improvement on the 1968 tape, which has a slightly improved high-frequency response. Help, like the vinyl, has a rather muddy sound, which, to be fair, is only marginally worse on the tape. This is You're Gonna Lose That Girl from side one of that album, and as you can see, both vinyl and tape are found wanting in the high-frequency areas. Rubber Soul has a much smoother sound, with none of the mid-range harshness of the early mono vinyl copies, which is more obvious on tracks like this one, Drive My Car, which is full and loud, but again not as clear and clean as the vinyl. But what about the stereo reel of Rubber Soul? Well, here's Norwegian Wood, which, unlike the mono tape, is the first track on side one, compared with the first pressing Dash 2 vinyl version of that track. The tape is loud and dynamic, and makes the vinyl look a little weedy in comparison. Certainly, the dynamics are better than the mono reel, and I was impressed by the sound quality of the whole of this tape when compared to the vinyl. I'd certainly recommend getting these four-track stereo tapes, if you can find them. Another advantage of these tapes is that they completely eliminate sibilance and groove wear. Its absence is especially noticeable on tracks like Michelle on this album and Eleanor Rigby and Here, There and Everywhere on Revolver. By the way, the version of Tomorrow Never Knows on the mono tape reel is the regular Remix 8 version and not the alternate take found on the 606-1 vinyl. This particular tape of Revolver is a 1968 reissue and uses a different tape formulation than the 1966 reel which gives it a little more information above the 10k range than the earlier tapes. This is And Your Bird Can Sing, and although there's a little more high-end than the earlier reels, it comes off second best to the vinyl. You'll be reassured to know that the reel of a collection of oldies album sounds just as terrible as the vinyl. To illustrate that, here's a comparison of the album's only notable track, Bad Boy. Both are quite dynamic, but as you can see when we switch to the spectrograph, the reel suffers badly again from hardly any frequencies above 11k. Although there's quite a sharp cutoff at 15k on the vinyl, it's still the better sounding of a rotten pair. Sergeant Pepper, despite its frequency range limits, doesn't sound bad at all. It retains a lot of the dynamics of the vinyl and has a high-end ceiling of about 12k, which on the vinyl already begins to drop off at 15k. If only they'd done this one at 7.5 inches per second. Incidentally, the inner groove gobbledygook, which ends side 2 of the vinyl LP, is included on this tape, but you only get a fraction of a second of it, the equivalent of one revolution on the vinyl LP. Another odd thing about the Sgt Pepper reel is that the cover image on the box is slightly wider than the vinyl cover, so you get to see a fraction more of the image on both sides. The White Album was simultaneously released in both mono and stereo on the larger 5-inch reels, and everything sounds pretty much the same as the vinyl. However, the cover insert misspells Piggies as Piggiest. As I mentioned before, Magical Mystery Tour and Yellow Submarine were never released on reel-to-reel -reel in the UK but mono versions of both Abbey Road and Let It Be were. These weren't dedicated mono mixes, but just fold downs of the stereo mixes, and you get the same effect if you just push the mono button on your amp or your speakers together. Here's a recording of I Dig A Pony from the mono reel of Let It Be, and as you can see, there's very little to get excited about sonically. So no points for sound quality, but 10 out of 10 on the rarity scale. EMI continued making reel-to-reel -reel tapes well into 1970, and the final Beatles-related release was Paul McCartney's first solo album, 
which was issued in both stereo and mono. EMI finally opened up their own tape duplicating facilities at their factory in Hayes in 1970, and the reel-to-reel -reel format was dropped from their catalogue at that point. It was the dawn of a new decade and a new era for tape. The compact cassette had been patiently waiting in the wings since 1963, but its time had now come. But that's a story for another day. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give me a big thumbs up and consider subscribing because there's a lot more like this on the way. But I'll say bye for now and thanks for watching.